Hello and welcome back to Edited Poorly by Tom the Scapegoat. I'm your host, Tom the Scapegoat, and today we'll be reading poorly, continuing Rise and Kill First by Ronan Bergman, Chapter 1, In Blood and Fire. On September 29th, 1944, David Shamron hid the gloom of St. George Street, not far from the Romanian church in Jer uh, Jerusalem. A church building was used as officers' lodgings by the British authorities governing Palestine, and Shamron was waiting for one of those officers, a man named Tom Wilkin, to leave. Wilkin was the commander of the Jewish unit at the Criminal Investigation Department, or CID, of the British Mandate for Palestine. And he was very good at his job, especially the part that involved infiltrating and disrupting the fractious Jewish underground. Aggressive, yet also exceptionally patient and calculating, Wilkins spoke fluent Hebrew, and after 13 years of service in Palestine, he had an extensive network of informants. Thanks to the intelligence they provided, underground fighters were arrested, their weapons caches were seized, and their planned operations aimed at forcing the British to leave Palestine were foiled, which was why Shamron was going to kill him. Shamron and his partner that night, Yaakov Benai, codenamed Mazal, or Luck, were operatives with Lehi, the most radical of the Zionist underground movements fighting in the British, fighting the British in the early 1940s, read poorly. Though Lehi was the acronym for the Hebrew phrase, Fighters for the Freedom of Israel, the British considered it a terrorist organization, referring to it dismissively as the Stern Gang after its founder, the romantic ultra-nationalist Avraham Stern. Stern and his tiny band of followers employed a targeted mayhem of assassinations and bombings, a campaign of personal terror as Leahy's operationals, operations chief and later Israeli prime minister, Yitzhak Shamir, called it. Wilkin knew he was a target. Leahy already had tried to kill him and his boss, Joffrey Morton, nearly three years earlier, in its first clumsy operation. On January 20th, 1942, assassins planted bombs on the roof and inside the building of 8 Yayu Street in Tel Aviv. Instead, they ended up killing three police officers, two Jews and an Englishman, who arrived before Wilkin and Morton and tripped the charges. Read poorly, my bad. Later, Morton fled Palestine after being wounded in another attempt on his life, that one in retribution for Morton having shot Stern dead. None of those details, the back and forth of who killed whom and in what order, mattered to Shamron. The British occupied the land the Zionists saw as rightfully theirs. That was what mattered, and Shamir had issued a death sentence against Wilkin. For Shamron and his comrades, Wilkin was not a person but rather a target prominent and high value. We were too busy and hungry to think about the British and their families, Shamron said decades later. After discovering that Wilkin was residing in the Romanian church annex, the assassins set out on their mission. Shamron and Benai had revolvers and hand grenades in their pockets. Additional Leahy operatives were, the, were in the vicinity, smartly dressed in suits and hats that looked like Englishmen. Wilkin left the officers' lodgings in the church and headed for the CID's facility in the Russian compound, where underground suspects were held and interrogated. As always, he was weary, scanning the street as he walked past, keeping one hand in his pocket at all times. As he passed the corner of St. George and Maya Sharim streets, a youngster sitting outside the neighborhood grocery store got up and dropped his hat. This was the signal, and the two assassins began walking towards Wilson, Wilkin, identifying him according to the photographs they studied. Shamron and Benai let him pass, gripping their revolvers with sweating palms. They turned around and drew. Before we did it, Mazal, Benai said, let me shoot first. Shamron recalled, but when we saw him, I guess I couldn't restrain myself, and I shot first. Between them, Benai and Shamron fired 14 times. 11 of those bullets hit Wilkin. He managed to turn around and draw his pistol, Shamron said, but he fell face first. A spurt of blood came out of his forehead like a fountain. It was 
not such a pretty picture. Shamron and Benai darted back into the shadows and made off in taxi, in which another lady man was waiting for them. The only thing that hurt me was that we forgot to take the briefcase in which had all his documents, Shamron said. Other than that, I didn't feel anything, not even a little twinge of guilt. We believed the more coffins that reached London, the closer the day of freedom would be. The idea that the return of the people of Israel to the land of Israel could be achieved only by a force was not born with Stern and his Leahy comrades. The roots of that strategy can be traced to eight men who gathered in a stifling one-room apartment overlooking an orange grove in Jaffa on September 29, 1907, exactly 37 years before a fountain of blood spurted from Wilkins' head when Palestine was still part of the Turkish Ottoman Empire. The flat was rented by Yitzhak Benzavi, I'll go ahead and spell that for you. It's Y-I-T-Z-H-A-K-B-E-N hyphen Z-V-I. A young Russian who immigrated to Ottoman Palestine earlier that year. Like the others in his apartment that night, all emigrants from the Russian Empire, sitting on a straw mat spread on the floor of the candlelit room, he was a committed Zionist, albeit part of a splinter sect that had once threatened to rend the movement. Zionism as a political ideology had been founded in 1896 when Viennese Jewish journalist Theodor Herzl published Jerdenstadt, or The Jewish State. He had been deeply affected while covering the first trial in Paris of Alfred Dreyfus, a Jewish army officer unjustly accused and convicted of treason. In his book, Herzl argued that anti-Semitism was so deeply ingrained in European culture that the Jewish people could achieve true, free true freedom and safety only in a nation-state of its own. The Jewish elite of Western Europe, who managed to carve out comfortable lives for themselves, mostly rejected Herzl, but his ideas resonated with poor and working-class Jews of Eastern Europe who suffered repeated programs in continual oppression and to which some of them responded by aligning themselves with left leftist uprisings. Herzl himself saw Palestine, the Jews' ancestral homeland, as the ideal location for a future Jewish state, but he maintained that any settlement there would have to be handled deliberately and delicately through proper diplomatic channels and with international sanction if a Jewish nation was to survive in peace. Herzl's view came to be known as political Zionism. Ben Zevi and his seven comrades, on the other hand, were like, were, like most other Russian Jews, practical Zionists. Rather than wait for the rest of the world to give them a home, they believed in creating one for themselves, and going to Palestine, working the land, making the desert bloom. They would take what they believed to be rightfully theirs, and they would defend what they had taken. This put the practical Zionists in immediate conflict with most of the Jews already living in Palestine. As a tiny minority in an Arab land, many of them, peddlers and religious scholars and functionaries under the Ottoman regime, they preferred to keep a low profile. Through subservience and compromise and bribery, these established Palestinian Jews had managed to buy themselves relative peace and a measure of security. But Ben Zevi and other newcomers were appalled at the conditions uh, their fellow Jews were tolerating. Many were living in abject poverty and had no means of defending themselves, utterly at the mercy of the Arab majority and the venal office officials of the corrupt Ottoman Empire. Arab mobs attacked and plundered Jewish settlements, rarely with any consequences. Worse, as Ben Zevi and the others saw it, those same settlements had consigned their defense to Arab guards, who in turn would sometimes collaborate with the attacking mobs. Ben Zevi and his friends found this situation to be unsustainable and intolerable. Some were former members of Russian left-wing revolutionary movements inspired by the people's will, or I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of this, it is Narod, Narod Naya Volia. Narod Naya Volia an aggressive anti-Tsarist guerrilla movement that employed terrorist tactics, including assassinations. Disappointed by the abortive 1905 revolution in Russia, which in the end produced only minimal constitutional reforms, some of these socialist revolutionaries, social democrats, and liberals moved to Ottoman Palestine to re-establish a Jewish state. They all were desperately poor, 
barely scraping by, earning pennies at each at teaching jobs or manual labor in the fields and orange groves, often going hungry. But they were proud Zionists. If they were going to create a nation, they first had to defend themselves. So they slipped through the streets of Jaffa in pairs and alone, making their way to the secret meeting in Ben Zevi's apartment. That night, those eight people formed the first Hebrew fighting force in the modern age. They decreed that from then forward, everything would be different from the image of the weak and persecuted Jew all across the globe. Only Jews would defend Jews in Palestine. They named their fledgling army Bar Yora, after one of the leaders of the great Jewish revolt against the Roman Empire in the first century. On their banner, they paid homage to that ancient rebellion and predicted their future. In blood and fire, Judea fell, it read. In blood and fire, Judea will rise. Judea would indeed rise. Ben Zevi would one day be the Jewish nation's second president. Yet first there would be much fire and much blood. Bar Yora was not, at first, a popular movement, but more Jews arrived in Palestine from Russia and Eastern Europe every year. 35,000 between 1905 and 1914, bringing with them that same determined philosophy of practical Zionism. With more like-minded Jews flooding into the Yishuv, as the Jewish community in Palestine was called, Bar Yora in 1909 was reconstituted into the larger, more aggressive Hashemur, Hebrew for the guard. By 1912, Hashemur was defending 14 settlements, yet it was also developing offensive, albeit clandestine, capabilities, preparing for what practical Zionists saw as an inevitable, eventual war to take control of Palestine. Hashemur therefore saw itself as the nucleus for a future Jewish army and intelligence service. Mounted on their horses, Hashemur vigilantes raided a few Arab settlements to punish residents who had harmed Jews, sometimes beating them up, sometimes executing them. In one case, a special clandestine assembly of Hashemur members decided to eliminate a Bedouin pol uh, policeman, Arif al Arsan, who had ass uh, assisted the Turks and tortured Jewish prisoners. He was shot dead by the Hashemur in June 1916. Hashemur did not recoil from using force to assert its authority over other Jews either. During World War I, Hashemur was violently opposed to NILI, a Jewish spy network working for the British in Ottoman Palestine. Hashemur feared that the Turks would discover the spies and wreak vengeance against the entire Jewish community. When they failed to get NILI to cease operations or hand over a stash of gold coins they'd received from the British, they made an attempt on the life of Yosef Lishansky. One of, the me one of its members managing only to wound him. In 1920, Hashemur evolved again, now into Haganah, Hebrew for defense. Though it was not specifically legal, the British authorities, who had been ruling the country for about three years, tolerated the Haganah as the paramilitary defense arm of Yishuv. The Histadrut, the Socialist Labor Union of the Jews in Israel that, found, that was founded in the same year, and the Jewish Agency, the Yishuv's Autonomous Governing Authority, established a few years later, both headed by David Ben-Gurion, maintained command over the secret organization.